On today's episode, we go deeper into Mars than ever before, Space Force has concerns about new Chinese activity, and the Pentagon buys a spaceship from an unexpected partner. NASA has a new strategy for exploring Mars that will allow them to look deep into the ancient history of the Red Planet and uncover the valuable resources hidden beneath its surface. They are sending a giant drill to Mars. Honeybee Robotics has announced that their red water robotic drilling system has completed end-to-end -end testing and will be ready for inclusion in the next round of Mars missions. The California-based company works with NASA's Next Step 2 grant partnerships to create new technologies for space exploration. They've designed and built a large, robust cold-weather drill capable of digging down over 25 meters to reach the layers of water ice that have been detected on Mars by observation satellites over the past decade. The most rigorous part of testing was done in chambers designed to simulate the extremely cold conditions on the Martian surface and used simulated soils as well as supercooled ice to test the hybrid systems that make up Redwater's drill hardware. Anyone who has had to attempt digging in a northern climate during winter will tell you that it's not easy. Water in the soil freezes down to a certain point, forming a cement-like consistency that can be challenging for even high-powered tools to break through. This effect increases the lower the temperature drops. When the Phoenix lander set down at the Martian North Pole in 2008, it found very similar conditions, with the average temperature being around negative 60 degrees Celsius, the ground was frozen solid, and Mars can get much colder than that, dropping to as low as negative 128 Celsius, or 262 Fahrenheit. To handle this, Redwater was built using the same technology scientists deploy on soil and ice in Antarctica, where temperatures can get as low as negative 88 degrees Celsius or 190 degrees Fahrenheit. The first system is a drilling method called coiled tubing, or CT. It involves a drill head attached to a length of flexible, yet sturdy metal tubing that can be pushed into the borehole using several different methods. Redwater is using a set of rollers that pinch the tube and push it down hole. The drill head itself is what's called a bottom hole assembly, and this is what houses the actual drill bit but it also contains the motor for running it and a compressed air system for removing material that might clog the drill. However, this system only works well in soil, so while the CT method is needed to do the bulk of the work here, after the first 20 meters, scientists are fairly certain that solid water ice will be uncovered, which is where the second method begins. This is called the Rodriguez well or Rodwell technique. It is used quite a bit in Antarctica for maintaining subsurface boreholes, and it's a well-tested method for getting through tough old ice. Instead of drilling all the way, a small cavity is formed in the top of the ice by a drill. This makes sure that there will be a layer of solid ice at the roof of the new well to stop contaminants in the soil from getting in. From there, the ice is melted into a large well, and the resultant water is pumped back out while maintaining a certain water level for use. Using both methods, the honeybee engineers believe that their red water machine should be able to create stable wells for use by Martian colonies, even at the warmer equatorial regions. The drill itself has been designed to fit onto a fairly bare-bones rover that packs up into a hexagonal package and is meant to be as efficient as possible. Engineer briefs made back in 2019 show that the robot's large deployable solar panels should be able to provide all the electricity needed for the drilling, heating, and pumping operations. Pneumatic tests show that Redwater can use both compressed Martian air or components of the rocket fuel that can be made from the water itself. And so this machine could be more or less self-sufficient while providing water for drinking and the production of hydrogen rocket fuel, which is the ultimate goal of this project. Drilling on Mars would provide more than just minerals and water, it would give a much clearer picture of a Mars that had flowing water. The priority right now is to get Redwater tested so that teams of these robots can dig wells and establish a livable foothold on the planet's surface, but the science gained from being able to dig further than we ever have would be extremely valuable. And luckily, Redwater can do all of these things at the same time. On March 18th, the United States Air Force issued a report stating that the Chinese military had begun preparing commercial satellite contractors for orbital refueling exercises, with plans being drawn up for both peacetime and wartime logistics work. In terms of the raw mechanics, the People's Liberation Army has been making sure that they can refuel important Chinese satellites regardless of the political climate on the ground. 
In an effort to properly plan for this, the report says that the PLA has been working on simulations and has even carried out tech demonstrations in an effort to add regular missions of this type to their duties. This isn't too different from satellite maintenance missions that used to be completed by NASA shuttlecraft. In fact, the US has been actively looking into several companies who might be able to create new vehicles that can essentially do what the PLA is trying to figure out, that being to refuel and push older satellites into more useful orbits to continue their operational lifespan. The PLA had originally started with discussions in their textbooks in 2013, emphasizing a need for the Chinese government to be able to maintain their satellites under any conditions. The Shanghai Academy of Spaceflight Technology then began showing off their on-orbit gas station in 2018. The design brief for this vehicle showed a service craft with deployable solar panels and grasping mechanisms, arms that could be used to lock the refueling module to a satellite. The Air Force report believes the initial designs here to be copies of a Northrop Grumman concept. But in 2022, the Xijian-21 satellite was launched by the state-run China Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation, and it managed to pull a defunct satellite into a higher graveyard orbit, proving that China now had the capability of servicing their equipment in space. Now obviously, the Air Force isn't worried about the Chinese military moving some space trash around, the report is clear that while the Air Force is mildly concerned about the possibility of a Chinese orbital robot grappling one of their satellites in a surprise attack, that has a very low chance of happening. The report itself says that these grappling vehicles are so large that they can easily be tracked and dodged should they start making a run on a US satellite. However, this possibility does distract from the real problem. The US is also behind on making sure they can service their satellites without interruption should they go to war with a country that is capable of spaceflight. Both China and the US are making use of commercial contractors to help get their infrastructure up and running, so the space race is getting very literal. Add to that Russia's recent anti-satellite activity spotted by the US, and it seems like more and more military activity is taking over our orbit. The Pentagon's Defense Innovation Unit has announced that Firefly Aerospace has been contracted to study the feasibility of their new orbital transfer vehicle, Elytra. Announced in August of last year, Elytra is a customizable support vehicle designed to cover any customer's needs in orbit, from initial placement into the orbit of your choice to capture and manipulation of craft already in space. And as Firefly puts it, Elytra can do this from here to the cislunar sphere. This is what the DoD is interested in the ability to quickly and reliably move vehicles and objects around low Earth orbit, geostationary orbit, and as far out as the moon whenever they need to. According to Firefly, the Elytra was developed using the flight hardware found in their Alpha launch vehicle, as well as several systems taken from their Blue Ghost lander, specifically a carbon composite structure. They also made specific mention of taking lessons learned from the Sherpa space tug developed by Spaceflight Industries after the company bought them out. Currently, Elytra comes in three standard loadouts, Elytra Dawn, which can be hired for servicing in low Earth orbit at a rapid schedule, which implies that it's able to deploy much faster than the other configurations. Elytra Dusk appears to be something more similar to Blue Origin's Blue Ring vehicle, with a specific focus on being able to maneuver all the way out to geostationary orbit. And finally, Elytra Dark, a much more robust looking vehicle that can apparently facilitate transfers from low Earth orbit all the way to the moon and beyond, which is likely a reference to the DIU's design request to have the ability to reach the entirety of geostationary orbit, extending all the way to the Earth-Moon Lagrange point on the far side of the lunar orbit. Firefly was contracted under the Defense Innovation Unit's Sinequon project, which began requesting solutions for the DoD's orbital infrastructure problem back in 2022, and had to compete with 112 different plans put forward by 94 companies. Getting contracted isn't a guarantee of a full decision. Firefly now has to demonstrate the abilities of their vehicle with a combined launch and orbital transfer within 18 months of approval to proceed. If they are successful here, Firefly would be contracted to make three to six Elytra vehicles, with at least one being able to make it to the moon, while lowering the time from manufacture to launch each time. That's a lot of pressure, and it's likely that the DIU will be looking at other companies at the same time, but Firefly is hardly a stranger to working with the US Defense Department. Back in September last year, they completed the Victus launch for the Air Force under similar conditions, completing the launch preparations, payload fitting, fueling, 
and launch in under 27 hours after the order was given. Alicia might be a bigger project, but Firefly seems like they're up to the challenge.